talk about Go Away Canals, After Making Love We Hear Footsteps. And I want to talk about it in the context of something we briefly discussed, which is mutual recognition. So before we read the poem, let's go over this whole notion of mutual recognition. Mutual recognition is a term created by, anybody remember? Jessica. Jessica Benjamin in her book called The Bonds of Love. Now with that book, Jessica Benjamin was writing about Hawthorne. And she was very interested about, in, in the way Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, would render love in his novels. Some people didn't do well with love, other people did. Why was that? And what she said again is that the parent must treat the child with affection and grant the child what, Veronica? What must you grant the child? The ability to individualize. Yes, the ability to individuate. So you have to grant the child independence. You have to treat the child as if the child is worthy of being herself or himself. Not do what then? Eric? Don't uh, constrict them and make them into who you want them to be. Yeah, don't constrict them and make them into little versions of yourself. Right? You know, uh, this is not too difficult to figure out. I mean, what if your kid wants to be an engineer and you're a doctor of medicine and you keep pushing the kid into medicine? I actually had this in, in a class where one of my students was in uh, pre-med or what it was in those days. It was one of the biology course uh, majors in those days. And her father uh, really wanted her to be a doc, and she wanted to be an engineer. For you civil people, I think she wanted to be in civil. She was really good in the sciences, but she wasn't interested in biology. She was interested in building things. And I remember her having an emotional discussion with our class because we were doing work which talked about just this kind of stuff, not mutual recognition. I'm sure her father was a very good man. But sometimes we suggest our kids do something that they're not really into. But it's worse when they are children, when they are infants to, to little kids. So we want to treat the child as if the child is an independent self. We want this, the child to individuate. So let's review that word again. What does the word individuate mean? Norval. Um, you asked me this yesterday or on Monday, I think, and I just said to give a person's own individual characteristics, like to let them to, shine. To let them shine and to have their own individual characteristics which are different from whom? The parents. The parents. To individuate means to separate yourself from your parents. Question? Well, or like siblings, right? Or siblings, siblings, yes. Because sometimes the older sibling can have an almost overbearing or over-influential effect on the younger sibling. Right. I suppose it could be the reverse, but it's mostly the older to the younger. Now, in a lot of poems we could talk about and we'll talk about later, such as Lady Lazarus. In a lot of poems, you see the mistake. You see the lack of mutual recognition. What I love about Galway Cannell's poem, After Making Love We Hear Footsteps, is it's an affirmation of love and an affirmation, in a way, of mutual recognition. What, what uh, Jessica Benjamin says in The Bonds of Love is that if you are going to have a good adult romantic love life. In fact, I think she would probably stretch this also into a good life with other people who are your friends as well, but especially an intimate love relationship. No matter your sexual preference, the mother especially, but the parents 
should treat the child in the way we've been discussing, as if they are free to be, as if the children are free to be whoever they want to be. And they will then grow up and want to be with somebody who is similar. And because they are used to being individuals, self-reliant and on their own, they will grant that ability, that quality, to their partner. Now this can show up in all kinds of ways. Right? I mean in just many, many, many different ways. Let's read this poem, and it's a very romantic poem, and let's see how it appears. After we read it, I'm going to ask you about the techniques and what you think it means, etc. But we'll talk about what it means also in the context of mutual recognition. Everybody with me? After making love, we hear footsteps. For I can snore like a bullhorn, or play loud music, or sit up talking with any reasonably sober Irishman, and Fergus will only sink deeper into his dreamless sleep, which goes by all in one flash. But let there be that heavy breathing or a stifled come cry anywhere in the house, and he will wrench himself awake and make for it on the run. As now, we lie together after making love, quiet, touching along the length of our bodies, familiar touch of the long married. And he appears in his baseball pajamas, it happens, the neck opening so small, he has to screw them on, which one day may make him wonder about the mental capacity of baseball players. And flops down between us, and hugs us and snuggles himself to sleep, his face gleaming with satisfaction at being this very child. In the half-darkness, we look at each other and smile and touch across arms, <clears throat> touch arms across his little startlingly muscled body. This one, whom habit of memory propels to the ground of his making, sleeper, only the mortal sounds can sing awake. This blessing love gives again into our arms. Goway Canal is a contemporary romantic. He is a contemporary romantic. What do you think I mean by that, if you're a contemporary romantic? This would go back even to our discussions of American literature and American poetry back in the 19th century when we talked about the romantics. So what do you think a contemporary romantic would be about it? Um, someone who talks about more intimate, more intimate things. Okay, somebody who talks about intimate things, but what do the romantics do? How do they go about things? Are they very rational? Are they hyper-rational? No, who is rational? The Enlightenment, and uh, the, the, after that, uh, the literature of reason, and Ben Franklin, and all those people, right? So, Kristen, how do they know? Led by the heart. They're led by the heart. They're intuitive. Okay? They're intuitive. So you were halfway there, Potter. All right? That was good. All right? They're led by the heart. They're intuitive. They're interested not in wit, although I think this is a funny poem, intentionally comic poem, but they're interested in showing us how uh, intuition functions in our lives. And they want to see in our lives how love operates, how emotion operates. Now, the other romantics would say that you could see the signature of God on the face of, of say, Bishop's Peak. Cannell is like that. Cannell does believe in God. Now, he's, he, he doesn't exactly believe in Jesus. He's, he was raised Christian, but he doesn't believe quite in that. But he is like the Romantics in that he believes in a divinity that propels life. 
In this poem, he clearly believes in love. Now let's talk about the plot. What's going on in the plot? What's happening here? Dana, in the opening lines, right down through the words dreamless sleep, the opening five lines, what is being described? Um, they're talking about the little boy, how he's like a deep sleeper and to accept for this moment. Right. This kid knows how to sleep, right? He is a deep sleeper. What's his name? Uh, Fergus. Fergus. Very Irish name. Canel is American, but he, he, his kids have all these Irish names, right? And so, and when he says, I could sit up talking with any reasonably sober Irishman, he's being funny here. He's not being straight. He's being funny with you. Why? What, what, is, what is the point of, of saying that? Chad? Irish people are known for being drunk. He's playing off the stereotype of the Irish who like to drink, right? Now, as somebody who's three-quarter Irish, I get this, right? I'm not much of a drinker myself, but I get this. And there is a certain celebration, not just of alcohol, but among the Irish of, uh, of li life is to be celebrated, and they use poetry to celebrate it. The Irish are perhaps the most poetry-centric national group. Um, Russians are pretty, they used to be that way, but the Irish are still very, very poetry involved. All right, so he sleeps. He never stops, he can sleep when there's any noise, right? But then something happens. It, that sleep can go by all in one flash, but that, let there be that heavy breathing or a stifled come cry anywhere in the house. And what happens, Nico? Once he, the boy, hears the lovemaking, what happens? He wakes up. He wakes up. So, what is Canel saying about the boy? What is he saying about the boy? The boy is not a perv, all right? What is he saying about the boy? I guess I'm being maybe even too thematic. What does the boy, what is a, a characteristic of this boy? Kyle? Curious. Yes, but why wouldn't he be curious uh, about uh, talking with another Irishman or uh, the music or, or anything like that? Yeah, it's a mystery. This is typical romanticism. This is what Canel loves. In some ways, it's inexplicable. When I say inexplicable grace, what do I mean? Unexplainable. Yes, you can't explain it. It's almost this kind of human secret. Something in the boy is awakened when something in the parents, deeply intimate, is also awakened. Everybody with me on that? Okay? Okay. Where did the boy come from? He came from the mother's womb. He came from some kind of deep history. Now it helps to know that Canel believes that we pre-exist our fleshly lives. So if we pre-exist, that means something like the soul that is, you know, Ben or Eric or Quinn or Veronica or Joe, something like all of you have souls, according to Canel, that was before you even existed in your mother's womb. And you start to develop, and you come out of that womb, and you can sense here, in just this section, that Canel thinks we're still somehow magically connected to that past. And how do you get made? How do you get to cross out of that realm into this realm of when your parents have sex. And so there is a connection here. Now a lot of us, myself included, don't want to think about our parents having sex. Right? But the poem is after a deeper kind of thing here. It's after a deeper way of knowing, and the boy has that way of knowing. He's very, very small. He could never articulate this. But he has a way of knowing. So somebody tell me what I'm talking about here. What am I saying about the boy, Alexei? What, what can he do? Um, he 
he's got some kind of intuition? Yes. The boy has an intuition that... Um, I don't know. Awakens him. Yeah. That awakens him. That somehow animates him. That drives him out of sleep and into some kind of consciousness which sends him where? How about Patrick? Where does it send him? Back to his mother and father. Right? Right. So where does he go? He will wrench himself awake and make for it on the run. Make for it on the run. So what, Dylan, is it? His mother. His mother and father, the place where perhaps he was conceived. Okay? As now. So after the dash, run. After the dash that follows, run. Quinn. We have a turn in the poem. As now. What, is, what are those two words suggesting? Um, not like the father's describing what's going on in that Yes. So the poem has this introductory kind of setup, which is fairly general in space and time. And then it funnels right after that dash to the now. Right? So we become temporally and spatially immediate at this point after the dash, with just those two words, as now. Right? As now, we lie together after making love. Who is that, of course? The mother and father, right? After making love, quiet, touching along the length of our bodies, familiar touch of the long married. What is the familiar touch, Mike? What's the familiar touch of the long married? Um, I'm not sure. I realize you're all too young to know what the familiar touch of the long married is, but what do you think? Just that, I mean, the way that I interpreted it was, the kind, it's kind of like the look that he gives her, like they both just mutually recognize the thing, they, they don't have to say anything and they know, know exactly what they're talking about. And they know what they're talking about, they know e what each other smells like, it feels like, and touches, touch like, right? The familiar touch is something that is not brand new. It's something that gives comfort because it's been done before. The familiar touch involves what is often called a shared history. A shared history. So Joe, what do you think a shared history is? Uh, it means that they put things together. Yes, you have lived together. And you've lived through things together. The good times and the bad, the ecstatic times and the arguments, all of that stuff, you've lived together and you know each other well. All right, let's keep going. And he appears. Who appears there? Who appears? Fergus, Fergus appears, right? And he appears. Now, I want to tell you, Cannell, in a later version of this poem, adjusts the following lines. Now, Chad, I don't know about you. You play ball some, right? Did you play some baseball? Right. I do too, so I was always a little put off about the joke here about baseball players. So let's read what he says. In his baseball pajamas, it happens, the neck opening so small he has to screw them on, which one day may make him wonder about the mental capacity of baseball players. Right? Another joke, right? which I don't take as that funny. But he actually took that out, that last part out, in some subsequent uh, publications of this poem. Really? Yeah. And flops down, I think he took it out because I think it started to remove us from the issue in the poem, right? I think it's a funny line, if you like that. But he, he, I think he took it out because it was getting in the way of the rest of the poem. So let's keep going, because it's good. And he flops down between us and hugs us and snuggles himself to sleep, his face gleaming with satisfaction at being this very child. Somebody tell me what that is about. What's going on there? What does it mean to gleam with satisfaction at being this very child? Sarah? I feel like Fergus kind of feels like he's the happiest kid on earth. He's the happiest kid on earth. What has happened successfully, Quinn, with Fergus? He has gotten mutual recognition, right? He has been allowed to come into this moment, and he feels really good about himself. Right? Now, what if they had mistreated him? 
or trying to change him constantly, he probably wouldn't feel this way. So again, this is an example of Jessica Benjamin's mutual recognition at work, right, where it really works positively, where uh, the people understand it. Let's keep going, though. In the half-darkness, we look at each other. Okay, so we know what half-darkness is, but why don't we go over that? What is half-darkness, Alicia? Dark, but you can still see things. You can st still see. Now, what is half-darkness like, do you think, for the boy? What, what would have half-darkness been like for the boy? Dreams, maybe? The dream world, in some cases? Maybe even the dream world when he was in the womb, right? The, th the, the kind of light that is almost uh, uh, otherworldly and, and that you associate with being called back to the beginning? I'm not sure, but Canel throws that in, I think, for a reason. In the half darkness, we look at each other and smile and touch arms across his little startlingly muscled body. Why startlingly, Catherine? Why startlingly muscled body? He's so young, but he's strong. <laughs> well, I don't know if he's buff, but he's certainly strong. Yes, right. And he, as a parent, sometimes, and I can tell you this as a parent, you can't believe how fast your kid has changed. Kids change really, change really quickly. Right? And you sometimes don't notice it for a bit, and then you suddenly realize they've changed. This one whom habit of memory propels to the ground of his making. We've really already covered this, but uh, uh, Colleen, whom habit of memory propels to the ground of his making. What does that suggest to you? Um, he's like coming back to the possibility where he was made, like the parents. Yes, he's coming back to the place where he began. Right, right, very good. And then how about this? Sleeper, only the mortal sounds can sing awake. Uh, we have an interesting introduction here in the next to last line of some small reminder. I put this term up here, reminder. What do we remember given that line? Colin. Can you see anything in that line that is a small, subtle reminder of something else? No? What's the key word? Mortal. Okay, what does mortal mean? You will die. It's not that you can, you will die. Alright? So, Sleeper, only the mortal sounds can sing awake. Here, Canel takes the sounds that we make during sex. But he's not just making this lust or sex. He is connecting it to mortality. That we propagate ourselves with sex. And the mortal sounds or what wakes and animates this kid, Fergus. Now, Fergus doesn't know they're mortal, but there's something deep inside him that recognizes that as well, I think Canella is suggesting. Everybody with me on, on that? All right? Okay. This blessing, love gives again into our arms. So I have two questions. What is blessing and why again? Right? What's the blessing here? How about uh, Ben? What's the blessing? Um, the blessing of the boy. The boy is the blessing. The boy is the blessing. Right? A blessing. Well, who would tell me what a blessing is? Veronica, do you know what a blessing is? Um, kind of like a prayer. Maybe. It's prayer. It could be prayerful. Anybody else? Grace. Blessing. It's a gift. Yes. Something that makes our lives much better. Especially better. All right? This blessing, love gives again into our arms. How about Keaton? 
Why again into our arms? Um, because the boy is going back between them. Okay, so how many times, Keith? The first time the first when he was yeah. born, right? He was born, yeah. And now again, again, right? Okay, this blessing love gives again into our arms. So now, and we also understand that he does this regularly, right? So when they have sex, he often jumps in, uh, runs down the, the hall, jumps in the bed with them because he is constantly awakened to that consciousness that animates him back to his own beginning. But one of the key terms, though, again, is that notion of mortality. That we will end, and our children, if we're fortunate, will continue. Everybody follow that? Okay. So before we end this, and we're just about over, what is the relationship between this poem and the notion of mutual recognition? What is the relationship between this poem and mutual recognition? Alyssa, how about you? Um, so the kid's like pretty comfortable. Like, Why is the kid comfortable? He knows he can run to his parents. Like, and what have the parents done well with him? They let him be himself. They've let him be himself. They've let him be himself. They have loved him and they have let him be himself. You need both. Because if you were left to be yourself but without any affection, that's not mutual recognition. They give him both. So if any of you become parents, maybe you should keep in mind mutual recognition. Right? The job of a parent is not easy because you get tired. Right? And the kids don't get tired. Until about 8.30 at night, they don't get tired. Right? So, but you need to overcome your own exhaustion and give them what they need. Um, is this confessional poetry, like you're saying, like his kids, they have all Irish names? Is this like true? It is true, but I don't think I'd call this confessional. Because what we're hearing here is not humiliating. What we're hearing is not embarrassing. Confessional poetry is embarrassing. You know, to say that the couple makes love is not embarrassing. That's what married couples generally do. But I wouldn't tell someone, and then my kid comes in and we all snuggle together. Oh, you think that's embarrassing? Yeah, it's not embarrassing in the way things are in confessional poetry. Confessional poetry, you're saying that I have a flaw, right? Or my family has a flaw. Here it is. I don't think we'd say that this is a flaw. And parents, many parents know about this. This happens a lot. But that's a really good question, Sam. Okay, any other questions? Everybody get this poem, pretty much? Okay, that's it. Let's take, uh, let's take 10 minutes here. Okay, that's it. <laughs>